Atheists like to pretend they're smarter than the average person. You are the biggest jerk I've ever met in my entire life. I have a monkey at home that's smarter than you! Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Well, knock me over with a feather, it's Pastor Tom Brown, back again, saying something else stupid about atheists. While it is abundantly clear that whenever he opens his mouth, he's just preaching to the proverbial choir, and his attempts at chastising non-believers is more about cementing in the minds of people who already hang on his every word that they are oh so right, and anyone who disbelieves is oh so wrong. And not just wrong, but every bad adjective you can think of given the title of some of his former videos about atheists. Atheism has nothing to offer. Atheism is immoral. It's unjust, unintelligent, whatever else. A broken worldview, stupid, false. Atheists are liars. Because he has to constantly reinforce to his congregation just how absolutely right on the money he is in order to keep that money flowing to the collection plate and keep him flush in fancy homes, international travel, and big buildings in Texas to run his ministry out of. Leaning heavily on how important it is for his congregation to tithe the crap out of their incomes to him and his organization. Because should the trends in lower religious participation continue and his attendance were to drop off, Tom might actually have to get a real job doing something of actual value to society rather than being a quasi-religious sponge off of it. And so, to that end, he's once again talking about the problems with atheism. And once again, he's getting pretty much everything he has to say about it wrong. So let's dive in and spend some time correcting his near-constant misconceptions. But before we get to that, if you end up liking what you see in this video and would like to help out the channel, make sure to subscribe and click the bell so you'll always be notified when new content comes out. Check out my social media, including my Patreon and Twitter, all linked in the description. And of course, like this video, pop in a comment, all that goes a long way towards pleasing the YouTube algorithm. That grand digital power that everyone truly believes in deep down, but suppresses its truth in their unrighteousness, may keep my channel motoring along. Now on to today's video. Atheists like to pretend they're smarter than the average person. They like to view people who believe in God as superstitious. You are superstitious, Tom. You literally believe in religious superstition. Superstition is defined as a belief or practice resulting from ignorance, fear of the unknown, trust in magic or chance, or a false conception of causation or an irrational, abject attitude of mind towards the supernatural, nature, or God resulting from superstition. Now, I'm sure you object to the whole ignorance or irrational, abject attitude parts of it, but beyond that, this definition applies. You do trust in magic. God's magic. Oh sure, you may refer to it as God's divine power or something like that, but that's just splitting hairs. You believe in magic. And you do have a fear of the unknown. You don't know how the God that you believe in will judge your soul and where you'll spend the supposed eternal afterlife. This is why people sometimes refer to themselves as God-fearing, because of the fear of the unknown of where God will send them for their afterlife. A further definition of superstition is a notion maintained despite evidence to the contrary. And that would certainly encompass practically all people who adhere to a specific religious mythology, particularly Christianity. Christians typically believe in the creation myth, i.e. the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, and so forth, despite all of the evidence to the contrary. Christians typically believe in Noah's flood, despite all of the evidence to the contrary. Some other Christian bangers, like Seven Literal Days of Creation, despite all of the evidence to the contrary. Young Earth, despite all of the evidence to the contrary, etc. You believe in superstition, Tom, ergo you are superstitious. They like to think that their education has caused them to surpass this archaic idea of belief in God. It doesn't really have anything to do with education, per se. Your average atheist doesn't have any additional education to your average theist. 
I mean, while atheists are overrepresented amongst the most educated people in the world, obviously everyone on those highly educated lists are outliers from average society. No, in general, atheists have the exact same education as theists do. So it's not a matter of education, it's a matter of philosophical belief or lack thereof. And more specifically, it's a matter of epistemology. What reason or justification do you have for the things that you think, the knowledge you claim to know, and the positions that you hold? And basically, atheists tend to have different epistemological standards than theists do, and find that theistic belief does not meet those standards. And that isn't a matter of education. I mean, you can have 12 PhDs and still, if someone says they know of a magic zombie wizard who can read your mind, and look, it's all written about in this book I have, if you're willing to believe it just because, you might have a weak epistemological standard regardless of your education. The truth of the matter is, the scripture says, uh, a fool has said there is no God. You know, a fool is not someone who's uneducated. It's someone who actually sees the evidence and refuses to go by it. Ha! <laughs> the ironing is delicious. The word is irony. Huh? You seriously don't even see it, do you, Tom? Someone who sees the evidence and refuses to go by it. That's what you said. Like, say, the evidence for common descent that shows how humans are genetically linked to all other life on this planet specifically and most closely related to the other great apes that we also are. An extension of that being the evidence for the process of evolution by natural selection that explains the diversification of all life on this planet from earlier life forms. Or the evidence that shows that not only did the global flood certainly not happen, but that it would not even be possible for such an event to happen. How many things do you, as a Christian, take on faith in stark defiance of the evidence that is clear and definitive? Wouldn't that make you, by your own definition of the term, a fool? And the evidence is quite clear. We know one thing. Everything came into being because it was created by something else. I look at a tree, and I recognize that a tree came because there was an acorn. I look at you, I recognize you came into being because of a mom and dad. I look at a mountain, I see that it came into being by two land ridges pushing together, creating the mountain. Well, hey now, Tom, wait a minute. Plenty of your fellow Christians would say that mountains formed because God bippity-boppity-booed them into existence. The evidence would show that mountains forming from two land masses colliding is a process that takes hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of years. And there are those Christians who insist that the entire universe is only 6,000 or so years old. Now, even if you are not one of them, why do you diverge from that belief in the miracles of Yahweh and instead hold to what the evidence shows while outright denying other evidence that contradicts the Christian dogma that you do want to believe in? Seems like you're playing a la carte Christianity. But to the larger point, the whole idea of everything needing to come from something else as an argument for the existence of God is fraught with problems. You're basically making a contingency argument that the existence of anything in our universe is contingent on something that preceded it and caused it. For starters, that obviously can't be a hard and fast, eternal, all-encompassing rule that applies to everything forever and ever. Even in your own way of thinking, it can't hold because you hold that God is the first cause, or the uncaused cause, the prime mover from which all other things flow. So you don't even hold to the idea that everything has to come from something else. And if that works for your God concept, there's no rational reason why it can't work for other things, too. So long as those other things are outside the bounds and rules of our universe. Such as, for instance, a primordial singularity that the universe would have expanded out of? See, contingency arguments only get you to some contingent thing. It does not get you anywhere near your God concept. 
It can just as easily just get you to pure natural processes flowing from naturally existent things without intelligence, will, or intentionality. Also, obviously the rules of physical reality wouldn't apply to such a thing. A physical reality itself that hasn't happened yet. So, saying that everything needs to come from something else is a rule that applies within our universe as per the laws of physics. But how can you say with any certainty that such rules apply when and where the laws of physics themselves do not apply? How can you say that things outside the universe are bound by the same rules of contingency as things contained within the universe? That's like saying that because things on Earth fall at 9.8 meters per second per second, that things out in space on the other side of the universe must also fall at 9.8 meters per second per second. It's, it's just silly, Tom. In other words, everything we see today, it all came from something else. In other words, you cannot say that something came out of nothing. It doesn't exist. That's not possible. Common sense tells us that everything came because of something. Hebrews 11.1 1. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Romans 4.17 As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. It is your belief that God made the universe out of nothing. You believe that there was nothing except God, and then God literally spoke the universe into existence. Not that God took some giant, unformed conglomeration of pre-existing matter and shaped it into the universe. Not that God took part of himself, separated it from himself, and turned that into the universe. But that God literally created everything out of nothing. Creation ex nihilo. Creation out of nothing. It is and always has been a cornerstone of the Christian faith. So stop saying that atheists think everything came out of nothing. We don't. You do. The most common secular position on the formation of the universe, that being the current Big Bang cosmological model, calls for the universe expanding out of a primordial singularity. There is nothing about that model that posits something coming from nothing. If you're going to keep saying believing something came from nothing is silly, as a defeater to the cosmic perspective, then it's a defeater to your cosmic perspective, not ours. Now, you take us back to the very first act of creation. Formation. Saying act of creation is begging the question, which is a fallacy of any form of argument where the conclusion is assumed in one of the premises. By calling the universe a creation, that implies a creator, which is the conclusion that you're arguing for. Calling the universe a formation is true whether it was intelligently designed or came about as the result of natural processes without intentionality. Stop poisoning the well with loaded language. Scientists can tell you what happened at the very millisecond. They can tell you that this element created this element, and when this element hit, then this element was formed. They can tell you the process, but they can't explain to you what is the cause of the first element? Science is a mystery, but man, isn't it, Frylock? Yeah, it, it sure is, Meatwad. What did I ever evolve from the ancient dinosaur? I wish I had some of this stuff, boy. Not them tails. The tails that make them fly. Shut up. Damn. Yes, it can, and it has. The first element to form was hydrogen, and that didn't happen until quite a long time after the Big Bang began. Because early in the seconds, minutes, hours, and years after the Big Bang began, the universe was still much too hot and dense for elements to form. 380,000 years or so, the universe had again expanded and cooled enough for conditions to favor electrons staying in orbit around atomic nuclei. This is when recombination occurred, 
neutral hydrogen and helium finally appeared because they could recombine with, hold on to, electrons without easily losing them to stray radiation. I think what you meant to say, Tom, is that science hasn't figured out where the initial hot, dense state that everything expanded out of came from. That hot, dense state, it wasn't an element. It was a singularity. What is a singularity? In simple terms, singularities are places where the mathematics misbehave, typically by generating infinitely large values, like infinite heat and infinite density. It's where our understanding of physics breaks down, where all concepts of time and space cease to have coherent meaning. Now, where did that primordial singularity come from? We don't know. Our understanding of such phenomena is not such, at present, that we can answer that question. But no one says that it came from nothing. But then, for you to say, Hey, you don't know! Science doesn't know! Therefore, it must be God! is classic God of the Gaps fallacy. Just because we don't, at present, have an answer to a question of cosmology does not mean that God did it is a sufficient or satisfactory answer. Nor does it mean that God did it is just as good of an answer as anything else. Especially not when you're trying to use this line of thinking as a reason to believe in God in the first place. You're getting your cart before your horse here, Tom. You're saying that because science doesn't yet have an answer as to where the primordial singularity came from, that you submit that God did it, therefore everyone should believe in God. But no. You have to first establish God as a possible candidate explanation for the existence of the singularity, and thus the universe. Then you have to explain why that God is the most likely cause of the singularity and the universe. You're doing it all bass backwards. I could just as easily say that universe-belching unicorns from the 8th dimension burped the singularity into existence, and then belched it into expansion into the universe. And, hey, one answer's as good as another, right? It's just as likely as Yahweh, right, Tom? And if you say, well, we just need to go and we'll find out that it was this element that created the first element, well, then it ceases to be the first element, then we have another problem. What created that element? And then we go infinitum until finally you realize there is no explanation because you cannot say that the first element came on its own. What a bet. Yes, you can, because it very much did. The first element formed again when the state of the universe cooled down and became such to allow electrons to bond to atomic nuclei. The simplest atom is hydrogen, one electron orbiting one proton, and the electromagnetic force, one of the four fundamental forces of the universe, keeps the electron orbiting it. Once the universe had stabilized enough for this attraction to occur, it did through naturally occurring forces, and the first atoms, thus the first elements, formed naturally, very much on their own. You don't know what the hell you're talking about, Tom. So that's why belief in God is the most common sense thing for any human being to uphold. Because belief in God is to say that God who is beyond the universe is the cause of the first agent which created everything. No, belief in some creator force is to say that. To say that something was the initial cause of the first things would be appealing to some nondescript, unspecific, general force. And that might be common sense, but to then expand that into a belief in a god, that is to say, assume it to be an intelligent, willful, supernatural being, an entity, a conscious, living, thinking mind and personality, is to assign a number of qualities to this initial force that are completely unsubstantiated. And then, to claim to not only know all of this being's properties, but also to know its mind and its wants and desires, such that you've compiled rules and standards, behaviors and prohibition, do's and do-nots, and assign consequences to not adhering to these rules, 
And hey, follow these people as the chosen speakers for this being, and this organization as its vanguard, while all of those others who claim such an official status are pretenders and deceivers and false prophets and give me your money and m to me and mine so that I can tell you the true mind and the wants and will of this being that we all made up. Well, that is all... One big pile of shit. And when I look at the universe, it's made up of three things, time, space, and matter. It's literally every sentence with you, isn't it, Tom? Every single thing that tumbles out of your pie hole is wrong. Even if I would accept your list of those three things as all being valid, you're missing one. It would be time, space, matter, and energy. Do you not think that energy exists? Heat isn't a thing to you? Light doesn't travel in your mind, Tom? Also, time and space are not separate things. They are different sides of the same coin. In the context of special relativity, time cannot be separated from the three dimensions of space because the observed rate at which time passes for an object depends on the object's velocity relative to the observer. Therefore, physicists call it space-time. Not two separate things, but one thing, space-time. It's the same thing. But space-time is the universe, it's not something that the universe contains. Then, of course, you're forgetting about things like dark matter and dark energy, which are different from normal matter and energy. And there seems to be much more of them in the universe than the matter and energy that we're more familiar with. So, just... You're wrong. Everything you say is wrong. It's giving me a headache. It might be a tumor. It's not a tumor. It's not a tumor at all. So that means this God has to be beyond time, space, and matter. No, it doesn't. It only means that the unspecified cause of this universe, the cause of this instantiation of space-time, was outside of this instantiation of space-time. That doesn't mean that there couldn't have been other instantiations of space-time that it could have existed in. That would be something like the idea of a multiverse, and maybe something from another universe could have caused our universe. Or higher dimensional occurrences affecting our three-dimensional space-time or other possibilities that are beyond our current understanding or conception. And that's another thing. It's weird how Christians are so quick to cite the mysteries of God and that his motivations are beyond us mere mortals and he moves in mysterious ways. They say things like this whenever the problem of evil is brought up or any other inconsistencies of reality with the supposed nature of God as decreed by the Christian faith. But when a discussion of natural cosmology comes up, you all insist that the nature of the universe has to conform to what you think it should be. And if it doesn't make perfect and complete sense to you, then it's invalid and therefore God must be the answer. Well, as a much smarter person than either you or I says, The universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. According to the Bible, God is eternal, which means he's beyond time. He's everywhere, which means he's beyond space. And he's invisible, which means he's beyond matter. Eternal doesn't mean beyond time. It means throughout all of time. Everywhere doesn't mean beyond space. It means throughout all of space. And invisible certainly doesn't mean beyond matter. So you realize, if you're an atheist, you're actually being foolish because you're trying to say that everything came out of nothing. That's eventually your conclusion. Nothing is the, is the cause of the universe. I am an atheist. I have never said that everything came from nothing. I've been doing this a while and have met and interacted with many other atheists. None of them have ever expressed to me that they think everything came from nothing. Big Bang Cosmology, the secular model of universal expansion that most atheists hold to, does not posit that everything came from nothing. 
Atheistic physicists who have championed this model, such as the now dead but still very well known Stephen Hawking, didn't and don't believe that everything came from nothing. Once again, Christians think this. You think this, Tom. And much like everything else you've said throughout this entire video, that is wrong. So that was Tom Brown and his attempt to claim that atheism is a lie. Yeah, by the way, that actually was the title of this video. Atheism is a lie. And it didn't even seem like he was attempting to prove that assertion. He was certainly attempting, and failing rather spectacularly, to prove that atheism was wrong, and he could have titled it that. He could have titled it, Atheism is Wrong, or Atheism is False, or Atheism is Confused, something to that effect. But to claim that atheism is a lie... That would be an intentional deception on the part of those putting it forth. And he didn't even attempt to do that. I figured he'd be trotting out passages about everyone actually believing in God deep down. You know, the Bible's claims that everyone actually believes in God, but just suppresses the truth in their unrighteousness. I mean, it's not like we haven't seen other apologists do that time and time again in their evangelizing, but Tom missed the mark entirely in that regard. He didn't even attempt to establish atheism as a lie, but instead, just that atheists were haughty, pseudo-intellectuals who think they're so much smarter than Christians like him, and then proceeded to barf up completely incorrect attempts at scientific rationalizations, showcasing his utter ignorance about cosmology, atomic theory, physics, and basic logic and argumentation. I mean... I can really understand why it seems to him that atheists are always seeming to insult Christian's intelligence, because it's so easy to insult his. Every sentence was just completely wrong. He made mention of the old biblical chestnut that a fool has said in his heart that there's no God. Well, since he brought up fools... A much more recent quote that is sometimes attributed to Abraham Lincoln or to Mark Twain is rather poignant and germane to Tom. Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. And so that is where we'll end things for today. So thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Don't forget to check me out on Twitter and Patreon if you'd like to support my work directly. My Teespring if you want some Plinky merch. All that link below in the description. Special shout out to my most recent super thankers here on YouTube. Banana Slug 1951 Salvi Mike, II Launch, SBNWNC, and Archangel Ariel 262 Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.